Paris. We were enchanted by the idea of freedom. Yes, the revolution. Uh, sorry, we, the revolution, is a game about the French Revolution. One of the best I've played as a matter of fact, but then here's the other. It's a curious blend of puzzle game, historical drama, and political thriller that attempts to cram three years of the revolution into a digestible two months. It uses that time to explore themes like freedom, fairness, fraternity, and fatherhood. I'll tell you now, it's going off the rails with all of those ideas and more. The channel has been a bit low on Eurojank lately, so this is an offering from Polish studio Polyslash. It's a game full of charming ideas delivered with wonky execution. What more could you want from a game about such a time period? Our role is doling out what people see as justice in order to survive the turbulent politics of late 18th century Paris. We play a judge of the controversial Revolutionary Tribunal, a court established to cull counter-revolutionaries, but also wound up trying a lot of mundane cases as well, beheading people all the way. When it came to justice, you can do it fast or you can do it right. And as per Robespierre's wishes, we do it right away. Terror is nothing but swift justice. This may seem like a mix of Ace Attorney and Papers, please, at first blush, but as the French say in French and may not actually say, the outfit doesn't make the monk. This is a social survival horror game built on resource and reputation management, where unforeseeable turns can steal hard-won trust out from under you. This can make for an unfair time. But it's the French Revolution. It requires an open-minded player, able to trust the game to needle at them. Approach it like that, and you may see what it's going for, but sometimes, even cutting it slack, it will be frustrating without gain. I've got two disclaimers before I pull the rope on this one. This video will spoil the game. It's got a lot of flaws, but I like a lot of it, and even love a little. It has a good few surprises, and I'd argue it's worth experiencing. If this opening summary got your interest, Go play it first before watching the rest. I will say, however, you are very likely to come back angry at me. If I went back in time and told myself to play this game, I'd be mad at me. But I wouldn't say the time was wasted. 2. This game is full of French names. And I'm not going to get them right. Nor am I even going to try. Tonville will save us! Tonville! The actors have my back. Luckily, being English, in fairness, I'll say English bad too. It's not much, but it's the best olive branch I can offer. Though I'm sure you'd prefer a white flag. This is what first greets us when opening the game. You may think it on the nose, but the nose is actually on the scale. I do rather like this image. It communicates a melancholy tone, raises a lot of the game's questions, and it's just nice to look at. We've two modes to choose from, the fictional survival mode and fictional fiction mode. That's us. Oh, how postmodern. I do appreciate the unintentional suggestion that survival mode is in fact factual. It's probably more accurate. We, the revolution, takes a lot of liberties. Very much in the spirit of things. Two guesses what the other acts are called. The game opens with Paris in shambles. Father. Why did you disown me? I have your blood in my veins. How could you? Some bloke putting aside his present problems for some parental ones. We'll learn about him much later. For now, let's talk about the artwork. Originally, Polyslash intended to use pixel art, until the team set out to find a look which better suited the subject matter. They went through a number of looks before setting out to create a pastiche of classical and modern movements, massaging qualities of each into something new before introducing their own touch with polygonal rendering, giving the images very sharp, defined features. I rather like the end result. A friend who knows a lot more about art and possesses far more technical skill than I do doesn't. But sod him. He only made the thumbnail for this video, so what does he know? Follow Hot Cider on Utwits. It's only fitting that a game juggling so many ideas does the same with its presentation, and I'd say it works well. This game takes an eclectic approach in a lot of ways, and that won't always turn out to be the best decision. The art excels in character expression and sense of scale. Colours are often exaggerated or details subtracted to lend weight to scenes that need it. Like that image at the start tells us, this is a game going for striking imagery, and it worked well on me. It's very theatrical, and I often got swept up in it. The game has a handful of subtle elements, and it's good that the art isn't amongst them. While it has its slow moments, the promise of more art was often enough to keep me going, and the thought of certain moments being rendered in pixels makes me happy they decided to do it differently. This isn't a dig at pixel art. Every style has its place. We, 
The Revolution has a large main cast, adding people from the court cases, and this is likely more than 50 unique portraits. The painterly style allows for more expressive and varied character designs. After the opening, we join our protagonist Alexei Fidel and his mentor Raymond Devoyer as they drunkenly stumble into work. Raymond helpfully spills another major theme of the story. <laughs> For what it's worth, he regrets doing that. Speaking of regret, our family's here. Alexei's wife Matilde and older son Bernard aren't happy with him. Words getting around that we're a gambling drunkard, so the neighborhood kids started bullying our younger son Frederick for having a cool dad. He got in a fight and broke another kid's tooth defending our image. I'm proud of the boy, so we do as any loving parent would and hold a mock trial for him. But first, let's focus on me. Hierarchy screen. Ah, all alone. I'll bet Robert Pierre's hiding in here somewhere. Look out, Rob, I'm coming for you. Actually, wait, I should hold my tongue. He may hear my kid gave someone a crown. The first several days are spent introducing us to core court mechanics, and we'll tackle them as they come up, and this will take a while, but having done jury duty, that's just how it is. I'll give my verdict first and say that I do like the court gameplay despite a lot of rough edges. On sale, I'd argue it's worth the price of admission, if for nothing else than the stories of the cases themselves. There's some good little tales in here, from tragedies to comedic farces, and some of them are fascinatingly mundane. It explores the setting well through these cases. In this trial, we're introduced to the case file and finding links. This is the best gameplay on offer, and even then the quality of play varies case to case, and it has some blemishes that raise questions. The idea is straightforward. You read the case file, and then find links by connecting subjects to context, using the case files to clarify what goes where. On its surface, that may not seem like a puzzle at all, just required reading. But in the better crafted cases, there's a finely tuned ambiguity that made finding these links feel like I was connecting the dots and deepening my understanding of the case. I think it's natural everyone would start with the most obvious link and work downwards. If something is marked as evidence, that's a freebie. As you find these links, you eliminate possibilities from play, and this does lead to a realization, and that's that some cases feel like they wind up solving themselves. When I noticed I was doing this, I decided to test whether I could find links while skipping the file and found it was often more than doable. It's undeniably satisfying watching everything fall into place with no effort, but it does show how the links and actually understanding them are a bit detached from the case. To discourage this, the game has traps, which require carefully reading the case file to steer clear of. If a subject doesn't go anywhere or relate to anything, it means whoever wrote the case file needs to have their pay docked, and that you should probably ignore it. Granted, unless you only have one permissible mistake, then traps aren't much of a threat. One solution could be to have the context not be eliminated, keeping the puzzle somewhat complex and making sure each clue requires some thought from the player. But there is another issue which makes that solution a lot less appealing. The times when something outright marked as an accusation turned out to be something else. Now, on reflection, that's a clever trap in its own way, and I fell for it by assuming it was a gimme but it does sit on top of a genuine problem. That ambiguity has downsides. Despite these being based on context, it seemingly tries to be vague in really graceless ways, sometimes really stretching or inverting the seemingly established meanings of its own contexts. Sometimes subjects theoretically make sense for multiple contexts, and they may well link to multiple answers, or sometimes just one. At times, even when consulting the case file and reading it through again and again, it feels less like I'm figuring things out and more like I'm gambling on what the author arbitrarily set down. In one case where a building collapsed and killed several people, is the subject crowded flat talking about the victims? Or is it talking about the course of events? Or is it somehow an extenuating circumstance? Bear in mind, we're trying the architect. Well, it's an extenuating circumstance. If anything, even with the case file, this seems like an aggravating circumstance. It isn't saying the crowded flat hasten the building's deterioration or paint blame on the landlord for letting it get like this. It instead mentions how there are now orphaned children refusing to talk or eat. That isn't giving the accused architect slack, that's rubbing it in. Now, English isn't the developer's first language, but even if this was originally made by native English speakers and they were all brilliant wordsmiths, 
there is an unsolvable problem with a word puzzle like this. Subjectivity. These aren't logic puzzles. Even the same words can carry different meanings to different people depending on your experiences with that word. A puzzle like this is less about the case and more about reading the developer's intent, coloured by the time period, then by the characters, and slowly by the growing sense that they're being purposefully obtuse anyway. This puzzle isn't doomed to be a bad idea, but there's a natural limit to how fair it could possibly be. When I said, in the better crafted cases, was that because they were better written, or were they just on my wavelength? Here's the thing, for each link you make, you get a question, and you don't need to unlock every question to progress. As a matter of fact, you don't need any. It does hurt your standing, but you can limp onwards, just walking into court, handing out a verdict, and buggering off home. And, funnily enough, this may actually be more fair than the real Revolutionary Tribunal. Many of the mechanics take a similar approach, and taken all together, it's hard to tell if this unfairness is down to an earnest misstep or the design working as intended. We, The Revolution is an easy game that's slanted against you in a lot of little ways that give it a perilous facade, a sheep in wolf's clothing. So while I complain about ambiguity here, that may be part and parcel of what the game's going for. Whether or not that's an excuse depends on the individual, and I can forgive it, but I'm not going to pretend it wasn't more annoying than intense. Sadder to say, the courtroom manages this balance of fairness and ambiguity the best since it actually feels in service of one of the game's themes. Maybe I'm just upset that I'm an idiot who failed some puzzles, and at the end of the day, I still get to send people to prison, so I've got someone to take my frustration out on. Point is, you don't even need to talk to the accused to pass judgement, but as this is our son, let's pretend to be fair. What struck me after asking all of the questions and getting the whole story that he picked a fight with a couple of boys, they ganged up on him, and he more or less broke one of their teeth by accident, was how many details still felt uncertain. This turned out to be a common occurrence. Despite everything I've said and the artwork and such, this is a rather grounded game. It's rare to get a big confession or a dramatic breakdown. Most often, people are going to stick to their stories. Absolute guilt is basically impossible to establish. And once people are out of the courtroom, you'll never truly know if you made the right call. But for now, I go with guilty. It's best he learn now that the courts aren't messing around. But since Alexi isn't going to be the one to string the boy up, the somewhat happy family heads home. Hang on, I thought we outlawed that. We were enchanted by the idea of freedom. I know it's odd, but this is where I'm going to give out another spoiler warning. Despite the blemishes mentioned, the court cases make for some good little tales. A lot of the link finding puzzles are fine. So if we has your interest, go now. The next day we get our first proper case and the first of many Jeans. This one runs a tavern and has been indicted for watering down his drink. Now I know what we're all thinking but the guillotine isn't installed yet, so we're settling for jail. Luckily, so is everybody else. We're introduced to expected sentences and the jury. From here on out, our choices have consequences and all eyes are on us. The game features two, later three groups. The common folk, the revolutionaries, and the aristocrats. And the verdict we hand down affects our standing with each. The people are fickle, they'll love you one day and eat you alive the next, and it's rare you'll please everyone. We also have reputation, which affects a little of everything. Have a good reputation, the whole game's a little easier. Bad rep, vice versa. If you have a bad reputation, you are likely being incompetent on purpose, since putting in any amount of effort will have you hailed as an endless font of justice. Then we have the jury. Depending on the questions you ask, they can be swayed towards either verdict. Going against their wishes can incur a penalty where you'll take a daily hit to your standings for a while. Some questions will have their effects obscured, along with witnesses you can bring in who, depending on how you question them, can push the jury either way. This adds some guesswork and risk to proceedings. Some cases can be pretty stacked one way or another, but through asking the right questions, you can play a difficult crowd and get the verdict you want. The reason for my second spoiler warning is because I want to talk about the little arc I went along. I was slow on the uptake and didn't realise what the game was doing for perhaps too long. My own decision snuck up on me and I think it made for the best experience I could have had, and hearing mine means you will definitely not have a similar experience. The first time I played Wii, The Revolution, I approached it like I had Ace Attorney. 
I thought my job was to find the truth. Of course, Mr. Renard here had committed a heinous act and deserves punishment, but later on, as opinions were split and morality was murkier, I found myself in bad standing. By asking all the questions, I'd end up at odds with the jury. The lack of definitive guilt only complicated the decisions I made. The truth is elusive, questions are dodged, it's all he said, she said. There's rarely, if ever, a straightforward confession of guilt. And what with the whole revolution going on, there are opportunists everywhere exploiting the upheaval. Eventually, I had to call a verdict I disagreed with to save my own life. Slowly but surely, this happened more and more. Court days soon began not with checking the case file, but checking how a verdict would affect me and working towards the outcome which was most beneficial. I slowly stopped searching for the truth and started making it. That was my real job. The moment when I realized what I had been doing was great. The game had wrapped me around its finger. It clicked just how many people I had really imprisoned or killed, not because I agreed, but because it suited me. And by then, I was in too deep to really stop. It was rare that I got to feel justice was done without personal cost. Occasionally, I did go against the grain to do what I thought was right. But then there were the times I had to behead a woman for feeding a homeless former noble, or let a paedophile pimp escape that same, much more deserved fate. What made this work so well came from Alexei himself. In conversation, he often acts as though he's just doing what he feels is right, that he trusts in the law, even though we know we're abusing it. Other characters, and even Alexei himself in his inner monologues, tends to be a lot more sceptical. Me and Alexei wound up going through much the same process, me mechanically and him narratively. The mechanics of this are simplistic, and the outcome of verdicts is in no way hidden from the player. But thanks to some shoddy preconceptions, my morals wound up being eroded away. This may sound like a negative if you take this as underhanded manipulation intended to force your hand before pretending the player is a monster, and the game wouldn't have been half as impactful if I took this as an insult. This is not a schlocky guilt trip where the only winning move is not to play. It never felt like it was putting the onus of cruelty on me. Instead, it brought me closer to the setting and to Alexei. We has a complicated relationship with its protagonist. It's a little muddy by the end, but to simplify, it doesn't consider him evil, but he's clearly a far cry from good. He's a man who believes himself principled in a time where those principles would be untenable. He's deluded enough to rationalize his actions, but not naive enough to be blind to what he's really doing. While he's aware his role in the revolution is incredibly dangerous, he knows that trying to stop would definitely see him dead. And that's a lot going on, but it works. The story isn't overbearing about it, it just comes through naturally. That is our new symbol of freedom. You can still smell the fresh wood. Do you feel free looking at it? The game further reinforces this connection. Our way of confirming decisions is having Alexei sign off on them. Soon afterwards, thanks to Raymond being drunk, we get to design the tribunal seal. From then on, all of Alexei's decisions are joined by our own stamp of approval. I think it's saying something like that anyway. Honestly, I was just having too much fun with a stamp. My second playthrough obviously couldn't replicate this journey, and without it, it was admittedly a lot more hollow an experience. But that doesn't take away the fact that it fooled me once. I'm playing the game, and it did earn the right to play me back a little. We, the revolution, starts by asking the question of whether justice can be done when those in charge of seeing justice done are just as much on trial. Before the story is even really kicked off, it's yelled no about ten times from atop the Bastille, and realizes the plot needs a few more questions to stew over. One of those questions is, do we go out for drinks? At the end of the day, who walks in but Jacques-Louis David? Apparently, we promised to go gambling with him. A judge keeps the punt as honest. We're given a choice of going home or hitting the tables, and I think we earned a break. Plus, this is a real guy. Our family is fictitious. So out we go, and thanks to us, we know the drink's good. But we return home to a less than happy wife. If we don't go, she's pleased to see us, but... Either way, she comes around to some really contrived imagery. How Fred imagines us as a deep sea sailor rich with stories when we go out. But all she sees is a man stranded on a lifeboat. And while she will wait for us, we're at risk of disappearing from all memory. She says we have time to turn it around, which leads to a tutorial on family mechanics. The game says that in this mode we can decide how to spend time with them. But because we went out drinking, we can't and everyone likes us less for it, so, uh, I've got a bigger hill to climb. And so the tutorial dunks on me. It's a bit odd the game sets this precedent. In future, there are times we can choose to go out gambling again and piss off the family, 
but there's an actual reason to do so beyond just the fun of it. It's rather straightforward, everyone has their likes and dislikes, one action will please one member of the family and piss off the others. Each family member is tied to a certain standing, with Fred boosting the opinion of the entire family. The family also occasionally chips in on the expected verdict. You can win some points with all of them by going along with what they want, and I get the feeling they're either massive contrarians or trying to kill me, because they always go against what the general population wants. A good relationship gives a tiny bonus, and a bad one does the opposite. The love of a family will not make or break you. I have a feeling this mechanic exists less to give the gameplay greater depth and more to keep the family in mind for the narrative, so let's talk about them. We are punching above our weight with Matilde. She's seen by others as a perfect housewife, taking care of not only the kids but Alexei's elderly dad Aldrich. It's obvious that her relationship with Alexei is rocky to start with. There is some love left between them, but Matilde is tired of our vices, and over the course of the game what little affection she has left is waning. Our position as a judge endangers all of them and she's well aware of it, but doesn't really have the power to do anything herself. Our teenage son Bernard is old enough to be filled with revolutionary zeal, but still childish enough to not really understand the dangers of the situation. Alexei is worried his gullibility will get him to do something rash, since he'll be tried as an adult. Don't worry, we'll see his naivete destroyed in real time. He also wants to be a musician, which rubs Alexei the wrong way since he hoped he'd want to follow him into law. Frederick likes carving wooden figures, and is still young and dumb enough to love us. The game did successfully make me like the boy. These pictures are really nice, but it's concerning that Fred may have seen the scoreboard. I do wish the rest of the family had some equivalent presence in the courtroom, perhaps letters or seeing them in the gallery. It may be enough to make the more invested player think harder on a verdict and feel like their actions are under more scrutiny. We do occasionally get our dad talking us up at the cafe, and uh, yeah, dear old dad. Aldrich is a good man worn down. He has instilled in Alexei that the only things which matter in life are power and connections. A former merchant who lost his business at the hands of the Renard family. No relation. Many years ago, the Renards were buying up all the market stalls. When Aldrich held out, the Renards sent some lads over to sort him out. Our brother Bruno wound up getting provoked into a scrap, which led to him getting sentenced and exiled from Paris. Dad wound up losing the stall anyway, and the Renards are now incredibly powerful. We know that our brother Bruno has since died, but for now we're not told much. What's clear is the memory of Bruno weighs heavily on both Alexei and Aldrich. I like the family overall, they bounce off of each other well, and there's a good amount of depth to each relationship that gets explored as we go along. The mechanics around them don't amount to much, but it does act as a little mental breather and keeps the family in the player's mind. Before we get to the next major feature, there are a few smaller things. Nothing major, just the king stopping by the next day. Yeah, none other than Louis Capit the Bourbon. Ah, oh, the crowd loves it. The case was pretty fun too, a conspiracy about a locksmith paid with a Turgot map. Well, I'm annoying myself with that gag. Who apparently sent the details of some wealthy clients who we felt didn't properly pay him along to a master thief who got caught and shot. Ah, oh, there are some twists and turns here. But I'm a bit miffed at Lewis. I thought it was an exciting case. But he doesn't seem all that impressed. He leaves without a word. Which sadly means Alexi can get a few in. King Louis the Sixteenth. There were people who truly loved him. He reminded the French they had noble ancestors. Do not be manipulated by people who are not bearing the burden of responsibility. This saddened me. Someone had advised him to say that. Someone who was well aware of the cold, inevitable wind of change. I did not pity the king, but those who will come after him, as they will not have great ancestors. Now, as I said earlier, I love the cutscenes. The art, anyway. The voice acting is more of a mixed bag. I like the dialogue, but I think the art is doing the heavy lifting in letting it get as lofty as it does. It comes across stilted and desperate for some deeper meaning, and most of that falls on Alexei's shoulders. One thought guides their clenched fists. To bow before the new, uncompromising idol with his shining steel crown. I too have felt their eyes on me, just like him. A silent assistant in this ritual of new faith. A random acolyte, scared, doubtful. Will not the old gods seek vengeance for this treachery? He abandoned them all too easily. 
I think it was for the best the actors didn't try to affect French accents. Most of the actors know they're in a historical drama. They're not hamming it up, but there's a staginess to their delivery. Here's my favourite line. We want bread! Alexei, meanwhile, seems to think he's in a museum piece. His delivery is flat and oddly fast-paced. He hardly displays emotion, which hurts because he's often called on to emote. And in all but one instance, it sounds completely unnatural and not in a good way. This is particularly bad since a couple of cutscenes exist for no other reason than to give Alexei something profound-sounding to say. The wrath of strangers made me sick to my stomach. Feet stirred dark puddles. The air tasted like iron. A kicked, abused, and physically wounded soul. Their heads. What a cold and urgent order. The beast's eyes showed a long disguised bitterness. Yesterday's envy. These scenes are honestly so awkward that I'm willing to bet they turn people off of the writing, if not the game itself, completely. While the word pretentious gets thrown around all too easily these days by insecure morons who worry they'll look like they're trying too hard for enjoying something unusual, this doesn't come off in any way but pretentious. To flip this around somewhat, the next day Alexei and Raymond stop by to have a look at their freshly installed guillotine. And in this scene, Alexei sounds a bit more natural and expressive. And yelling about Louis and his entourage escaping Paris. So, we will not be enjoying the aroma of fresh wood for long. Perhaps wry quips just suit him, but just like Alexei is more skeptical in his internal narration, is he meant to sound less assured when he's talking only to himself? Is his flatter delivery to make him seem more grounded than other characters, ironically making one of the few wholly invented people seem more believable? His character biography even notes that outside of court he is unremarkable. And while he is still wooden in the trailers, he does spruce it up a little. But brotherhood, it is our one true success. It is the bond that led you all to my table. Let us eat and drink to that brotherhood, gentlemen. While it's interesting to think about, and there is more pointing to it as we get deeper into the story, I still doubt the flat delivery is wholly intended. Alexei still attempts grandiose speeches, and his life is the center of a bloody soap opera, and well, that's bloody with a couple of meanings. He's often called on to pontificate and react to personal tragedy. He just sounds out of place and he took me out of scenes a number of times. It's a good thing that a lot of the heavier moments are delivered purely through visuals and music. I may say this game isn't subtle because it absolutely is not, but it has restraint. This is a historical epic, and the lead often sounds like he's falling asleep halfway through Ben-Hur. We've had a few minor choices during all of this. We could spend influence points to confront the neighbours about our drinking. I didn't. Figured I'd bank the points. What are they going to say when I've got a guillotine? And naturally, they kept flapping gums. Influence points are a point of contention for me. But they do a lot, so I'll come back around to them later. We could choose whether or not to join a march protesting the lynching of a mayor. Our decision changing how either faction sees us. Most majorly, Burrell, Commander-in-Chief of the Guard. He comes along and asks if he has permission to shoot back at rioters. He needs official backing for the Guard to defend themselves. I was a bit of a softie. I went with a no. And well, this one had a small impact. Mostly on Burrell, seeing as he died at the hands of the mob. To jump to my other playthrough, I gave him the go-ahead. He fired on civilians, and this led to him being tried for murder. The story of who started the brawl, the citizens or the guard, is much like the result, rather messy. I do acquit him mostly to see if he sticks around in the story, and he doesn't. Either way, the game retires him. Many of the choices are Morton's forks. I'm going to withhold my opinion on that for a while. We've still got more mechanics to cover. But like the family, bear what I've just said in mind. So, from one death penalty to the next. The guillotine opens up people and our options. We can now carry out executions, relegating prison sentences to a middle ground option. I've got more to say on the guillotine, but first we have two hard cases. One concerns a cocky merchant accused of price speculation, who is really pushing his luck acting like such a cock on the day we installed the National Razor. The other hard case is Prosecutor Tinville, who has come to court to keep an eye on us. Fitting that on today of all days, we also get a pain in the neck. This is a real guy. And he got 2,500 people sent to the guillotine. This guy was a pro. Secutor. I'm not gonna lie, 
I thought he was a character of a man blinded by revolutionary zeal, but he might actually be toned down seeing as I call the shots. This might be a very fair showing of him. He also brings our last meaningful addition to the courtroom, the report, a set of questions we need to answer accurately or else incur another penalty. It serves a couple of purposes, to check that you understand the literal events of the case. If you're pushing for a certain verdict, answers to the report may lie in questions that harm the truth you want. It asks you to strategize a little. You could try and make a stab at an answer based on what seems reasonable, or ask questions which may hurt you for a definitive answer. You even have to guess which question is likely to lead to the answers you might be after. It's a great little addition that rounds out the courtroom. It's also a reason to waste the wife's cooking. We can go gambling with Tinville to win favors, allowing us to file a bad report at no cost. All in all, the courtroom may sound like a lot to keep in mind. I had one friend fall off the game as the system started to seem like overkill. I agree, there seems to be a lot to keep in mind, but the courtroom only really moves at your pace. The systems are all isolated enough that you can tackle everything as it comes up, and it wasn't long before I had developed a little workflow getting better at cross-referencing details and forming little strategies. You make order from chaos. Whether that order has any truth to it, well, who's to say? Executions also introduce us to the speech mechanic and sadly I have nothing good to say about it. Before you make a speech, you're given a strategy screen. You can see each topic, the listener's attitudes to each topic, and a set of approaches to choose and some attitudes will be obscured. So, how do you respond to someone feeling attached? Is it with carelessness, humility, aggression, or manipulation? I'm sure each of you just had a different answer, but so, hang on, let's go and check. The winner is... MANIPULATION! On these totally fair scientific social media polls, you got the right answer. Good going. I mean, I suppose people on YouTube would respond to attachment with manipulation. Remember to like, favorite, and subscribe. And while we're here, just kidding, you were only right half the time. There's two possible correct answers it could be. And, uh, sorry to the people who the poll worried. And to those who picked carelessness? Or humility? Watch out, there are wolves about. So... It's an almost arbitrary memorization puzzle, and if you don't pony up influence points, you're going to have to take a couple of shots in the dark. After you enter all of your guesses, you do see how the crowd will respond, allowing for some course correction. It's not quite a Monty Hall problem, but it's similar. I dislike this mechanic, and I'll confess that nearing the end of the game I just busted out a guide. I feel a bit guilty for doing so, but these mechanics are just a step too opaque. Part of why I do feel that guilt is there's never much at stake anyway. Make a good speech and you gain some points. Make a bad speech and lose them. Reputation is basically on tap if you're making any effort at all in court, so much like the family, the speeches are just here to top you off. I'm salty, but it's not like I have to drink the sea, which is a saying meaning that it's not that hard. The relationship between attitudes and approaches probably only makes total sense to whoever was put in charge of the system, and the fact the player starts totally in the dark leads me to believe that we're meant to start clumsy and over the course of a playthrough gradually become more manipulative as we learn what affects what, making Alexei in turn seem like he's gradually becoming more dangerous. The issue is that, unlike the court system where we get to act on diegetic information, this is just slowly uncovering the actual links between essentially meaningless prompts. In aid of that end, the gains and repercussions of speeches are kept minimal. This mechanic is just for a few more points, which is really bizarre to me. Anyway, the accused is probably getting bored, so let's move him along. This guy loves it. What a wonderful sea of faces. Let's talk about the guillotine a moment. Its inception is a funny thing. Its first showing didn't go quite so well. The crowd found it too clean and efficient. They wanted their gallows back. This crowd's thinking the guillotine is all drop, stop, and heads roll, cause this shit's fire. But in reality, it took time for people to warm to it. Besides, they couldn't get their showier kills back. The country had recently banned all methods of execution besides beheading to make the death penalty egalitarian. But some bloke called Sanson, a fourth generation executioner, which is a hell of a family trade, had to point out that beheadings are impractical. 
You need a skilled hand, the swords often break, and the Paris headman only has two. So a bloke called Guillotine proposed a machine to do the job cleanly and consistently. The aim was to make sure that everyone got the same experience. It was prototyped by Antoine Lewis and Tobias Schmidt, and called a Louis set. I prefer this name since it allowed Louis to set heads aside, but, well, the name went to the ideas guy. All this aside, I do appreciate that the first man to die to what became known as the National Razor was named Nick. The heading machines had already existed, the guillotine just improved on them by having a sloped blade and dropping from a greater height, which led to more reliable cuts. It still needed to be taken down and rebuilt between people, and it took calibration. Luckily for Alexei, he's killing less than one person per day on average. Still, tallying my end of game kill count, I think I was just a smidgen less lethal on average than the actual Revolutionary Tribunal, and my reputation was tip top. Well, 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 look who the Jacobins dragged in. Mate, if you didn't enjoy the last trial, you're gonna hate this one. If you're wondering why he's battered, uh, that's my bad. I didn't want to say no to the guards after the whole Burrell business. We can tidy him up. But well, this is a mess fit for a king. Let's talk about historicity for a moment. I'm not going to actually knock the game for inaccuracy because accuracy wasn't really the point. Besides, I'd be beyond out of my depth if I tried to do so. The game moves the revolution around for the purposes of the story it's going for. But for the sake of fun, let's go over a few things. For starters, King Lou wasn't tried at a revolutionary tribunal. It wasn't even active while that was going on in late 1792. That mayor we could have gone marching for? That was a real lynching that took place on March 3rd, 1792, four months before the Provisional Revolutionary Tribunal was even formed in response to the storming of the Tulleries. This Provisional Tribunal was then closed as Lou's trial began. Lou's trial was done by the convention. He was sentenced to death and executed in January 1793. We can call on Postmaster Duray as a witness. The flight to Varennes Lou attempted earlier this week was a complete cock-up. It required multiple stop-offs for repairs and so on. That and it actually happened in 1791, a whole year before the lynching that happened the other day. But for the purposes of the story, they've been flipped around and set days apart. Anyway, during one of the King's stop-offs, DeRay checked the King's falsified documents, which didn't really help since, well, he recognised the King. DeRay here is more or less the reason Lou and his entourage were caught and arrested. DeRay was offered a pretty big cash reward, but turned it down, and would later join the convention, falling in heavily with one of its most violent factions. Yeah, this is a real guy, and funnily enough, he was really at King Lou's trial. His real name was Drouet, which adds a wonderful irony to him uncovering the king. He's actually one of the few historical figures in this game who made it out of the revolution intact. Most everyone we meet has a guillotine in their actual future. When the revolution turned on the likes of Robespierre, Tinville, and other deputies who caused the reign of terror, this dude was just chilling, being a prisoner of war for three years. This makes him the second Jean we've met who was lucky to be in jail. And funniest thing of all, what with the restoration of the monarchy in 1814, he died under a false name. The Revolutionary Tribunal didn't actually start until March 1793, a couple of months after Lewis's death, which is when Tinville came into the picture. They did get to try Marie Antoinette, so they did get their own crack at the ancient regime. I didn't say that right, who cares. It was fun to dip my toes in and realise just how bloody, chaotic, and bloody chaotic the whole thing was. There is some order created in We, the Revolution, but the chaos is still very much intact. I got to learn just how little I know. If I've gotten anything wrong here, and I probably have, please correct me. And if you don't mind throwing me some of the odder tales of the French Revolution, I'd love to read them. I should also say, I did all of my research after I finished the game because, what, you think I'm gonna look up spoilers? Despite being a simplification and shuffling the timeline a lot, this is still a game that will reference Jacobins, Girondins, Muscadins, Sans-Culottes, The Law of 22, several real publications of the time, the contemporary view of religion, women's rights, an absolute ton of minor historical figures, and much more. Seeing as Alexei is a man of the time and pretty in the know, people aren't explaining these things to him. You can get by just understanding the mechanics, and a lot is easily gleaned from context. The game may be railroaded, but it had already taken the revolution a little off the rails to begin with. When I first played, I was able to imprison Lou. You take a massive hit for doing so, and history doesn't change much. He's dropped in jail and forgotten about forever. 
Tragic, considering the restoration's only 22 years away. Meanwhile, trying to acquit the git will get me in shit, so sorry, Lou. We're not rewriting this bit of history today. Shit, Royalist got the light. Oh, thank the supreme being, it's just you. Where do all these papers come from? We're warned the crowd outside are getting restless. They want swift justice, so it's up to us to placate them. There is one new mechanic introduced in this trial. Asking questions now passes time before people outside get upset, resulting in yet another temporary penalty. In theory, this should mean we have to ration what we can ask, but this mechanic is the one most obviously impacted by reputation. If you have high reputation, which you would have to be self-sabotaging not to, the crowd outside may as well not exist, as there is just not a trial long enough for them to pose a threat. This time, it's scripted. And well, the crowd is pleased to know I was about to take a little off the top anyway, but they've got even more evidence against him. Oh boy, Lou, it's not looking good. We've heard of consecutive life sentences, but I'm about to try for the world's first consecutive death sentence. So, a lot of conspiring with foreign rulers, plots against the National Assembly, orders to shoot rebels, and by now even Fred's getting ready to turn Lou's head into a football. Yeah, I won't argue. In most games, killing the king is a bit of a capstone, something you save for near the end. The first time I was playing, I figured I had to be near the end of Act 1. But I could hear one thing perfectly. Bring us the king. I'm not. I'm only a third of the way through the first act. That's part of the fun of the French Revolution. Killing the king, that's just the start. We're on day seven. If I, in real life, am killing a king seven days from now, I've had a busy week and the videos are going on hold for a while. With my upload schedule, you probably won't notice. That evening, we're joined by Raymond. He's jealous and more than a little suspicious that Robespierre picked us to judge Louis's trial. Yeah, it's weird for a number of reasons, right? Perhaps as an act of petty revenge, he gives us the Turgeot map from an earlier case, unlocking yet another mode of gameplay. A weird strategy minigame where we fight a culture war for parts of Paris. Plus Fidel, as reward for his part in destroying the old rule, has been given the honour of supervising the construction of a statue outside his house. Sections of Paris can be controlled to either grant us influence points or boost the speed of the construction, taking penalties if we don't hit milestones in good time. At those milestones, we can take over a building in our district. Each of these allow us to spend influence points to more or less ignore gameplay mechanics for a day or two. And if you can afford these abilities, you don't need them. We have free agents who can each take over districts but differ in small ways. The Diplomat David can lower fervor in sections. Fervor is increased by having a poor relation with the faction populating the district. The Bruiser Clovis is best at fighting off enemy agents, which will eventually swarm the map, and can quell the riots that should happen if they slip past David. The Rogue Rommel, who we'll learn about soon, is a middle ground in combat and can lure enemy agents to a section. There are also revolutionary patrols who would target both you and enemy agents and go about inciting riots. If one of your agents is caught, you have to go and negotiate their release to put them back in play. Which means even more persuasion of an evening. Now, this isn't terribly complicated, but it is obtuse and poorly explained. Layer on the slow animations that start each turn, faffing about with the statue and unlocking buildings, moving agents around, and occasionally needing to negotiate their release. This is now a few minutes of every in-game day. And it's a bloated system, considering that besides not being very interesting by itself, all it serves to do is offer costly methods to ignore the better parts of the game, and more of the currency needed to do so. Unlike the family or speeches, it also lacks in any relevance to the plot, but it does pretend otherwise. The first time we kill an enemy agent, we're told by Clovis that they are working for a mysterious R. Robespierre, maybe? If he's allying with aristocrats, we must tell someone. Everyone. It could be Minister Roland. As long as we are not sure, we would only create panic. And as we take down more agents, it slowly reveals that it's none other than Renard. As far as I'm aware, this discovery has no bearing on the actual story. There's no special court case for figuring him out or anything along those lines because, spoilers, Renard is entering the main plot later anyway. I've mentioned influence points time and again, but let's briefly touch on them. They serve two functions. The player can either use them to bypass gameplay or to engage with events. For the struggling player, they're a lifeline, and for the fastidious, they're a bonus. 
They're refreshed each day and certain modifiers can affect your stock. They pose a simple question. Do you spend them to get around systems you find tricky or dull, or hold on to them so that when events roll around you can get the best outcome, which is usually some faction standing and a return of the points invested with interest? I take it that you're meant to be liberal with the things, but I can't be totally sure. At best they'll lead to unique cases, which is a good incentive. It adds to the replayability and gives some actual weight to the points. And sometimes if you ignore events, they'll swing right back around and hurt you, possibly just taking those points you were trying to hold on to anyway. Events can happen in court and in the evening, so you can never be certain when one will really be sprung on you, especially because even the day they'll pop up is random. Here's the rub. There's an event chain I didn't get to really see out in both of my playthroughs. A prestigious fencer wants to set up a private school, but he's being obstructed by greedy officials. A clever judge may do well to help him and gain a powerful ally. First time around, I lacked the influence to back him and had to ignore his request. This gets taken as an insult and he goes and finds somebody else, which led to a lot of backstabbing and murder. What's funny is I had the influence points to end this one in my favour as an enemy of the school. It winds up with Alexi looking like this to the press. So I can't say this wasn't its own reward. Come next playthrough, I wanted to actually help his fencing school and see what came of it. It sounded like a great time. I love backstabbing and murder, so put me right in the middle of it. So, I played more carefully, held on to points, and I kept myself relatively well off. But a series of random events and global modifiers tanked my influence points anyway. Even if the event had arrived, I would have been locked out of it once again. I think it's fair to say that this is infuriating. I have no idea if me being so annoyed at the game is what it wants, but if it is, it's succeeding with flying tricolors. Gating content is a tricky prospect. Behind a test of skill or foresight, perhaps, but an unwieldy combination of luck and foresight, that's a stretch. We're now three hours in. The gameplay's almost at full bloat, and the actual story is about to begin. Kicking off an enjoyable political thriller, and the gameplay, Rob love it. It will try and get off its fat ass and keep up. After one last slice of cake. The next few days bring two new faces. Well, three. Saint Zhu called us a corrupt relic of the Enshon regime. And well, for one, I killed the king yesterday. And for two, Alexei isn't that old. Still, there goes some points. At court, we're going through Lou's close associates. I changed history a bit by imprisoning Marie Antoinette. Tinville wasn't pleased, but I don't know. I don't think she was molesting her kid. That was just someone being an exaggerator. One evening, a bloke called Henry O stops by. He's jockeying for our support to become the new commander-in-chief of the guard. He throws a bunch of honeyed words our way, and Alexei is more tired than anything by his barrage of empty flattery. However, our wife really, really likes the guy, and has said there's no way we wouldn't support such a fine specimen. In fact, this is the happiest we've seen her so far. What's going on here? Why does this feel like a fait accompli, Alexei yells. Ah, come on, mate. Don't get all French on us. We're also visited at court by Jean-Marie Roland. We apparently trampled all over his name during Lou's trial, and people are now gunning for him. The thing is... I didn't mention him. It's optional when pushes for acquittal. So this may set a record for the flimsiest opening to a plot I actually like. I do adore Alexei's casual dismissal of the guy. Eh, you tried to play the game and it didn't work. Happens. So he assures us that if he's headed for the guillotine, we'll be right behind him. That night, Hanryo sends a letter telling us Roland has dirt on him as well, and is likely already weaving an intrigue against us. So we'll need to beat him to the punch. This at long last, unlocks the second to last gameplay system, because it turns out this is really just a historical activity center. We have to get a certain number of points for a plot to succeed. Much like anything else, there's not much difficulty until very late in the game. And even then, I'd say we have to try to fail. Getting two points is basically an inevitability with the way the system works. The actual carrying out of the intrigues has three sides to it. The first is by doing yet more persuasion. This is where it can become clear how scared of failure the game is. The requirement to sway opponents is incredibly low, as though reality is just bending for Alexei's bullshit. We meet someone close to Roland, who can confirm he destroyed the documents detailing his connection to the former king. While this one is simple, a great many persuasions related to intrigues are treated as interactive cutscenes, which does at least improve the presentation and make them feel more distinct and noteworthy. Sometimes we'll need to choose two or three people to try and convince. This doesn't alter the story, 
but each person is tied to a different faction, so again, it's a little top-up. The most common interaction is reading an event and picking an approach between diplomacy, force, and espionage. Depending on which the game is deemed most reasonable, you'll be given a percentile chance of success. For now, it's spreading rumours about Roland to distance potential allies from the man. That sounds like a diplomatic job, so we send David out. I more or less walked through these. There is very little difficulty and very little fret. Lastly is making choices. And that's just making choices. Sometimes the enemy will counterattack. Oh, do I like a game with parry. I mean parries. Uh, but this is just a guzzied up event. Apparently Hanryo abuses his family. Man, what does our wife see in this guy? We come to learn that Roland's wife is the real string puller. Her political salon is actually a rather exclusive brothel, and one she uses to arm her husband with rumour and blackmail. So let's let Hanryo go topple the joint. Now, this has taken a few days, and we still have our day job. And on the way home from work the day after we ransack Miss Roland's establishment, Alexi is confronted by goons. You. Why are you making me suffer? Sleep. I'm by your side. I do not want to sleep. Not yet. I remember now. Ah, that's why our wife said it either way. We're saved by Grace Elliot and Gregory Rommel. It turns out this stabbing is not so cut and dry. That brothel we exposed had powerful people profiting from it, including the mayor of Paris, Jean Nicolas Pache, and the Archbishop Gobel. Alexi says he doesn't want to go to war with every influential figure in Paris, but by being put in charge of Lou's trial, he has more or less been thrust into the spotlight, and by upsetting Roland, we've now attracted the ire of his business partners. If we're to take down Roland and defend ourselves, we have to maneuver him into the one asset we have the courtroom. The intrigues are mechanically detached, but for whatever reason, I was loving the machinations of it. It's poor gameplay coasting on a story that manages to be fun enough. Anyway, Rommel seems to know a lot about the political situation, and stranger still, a lot about us. It turns out he knew our brother Bruno out on the front, and we were all he'd ever talk about. Anyway, how's the family feeling about me getting stabbed? Ah, like my insights, a bit mixed. Alexi denies to them that he wields any real power, and Matilde bites back that, well, we'd better get some before we're all killed. The next sodding day. It turns out this Roland business was all a bit of a cock-up. This was the death throes of a group of Girondins sent into a panic by their relationship to Roland and his relationship to the king. So a bunch of them are getting arrested all at once, and Robespierre lets us choose which Roland to arrest. Jean-Marie Roland or his wife? Jean-Marie Roland. Okay, funny thing, it's at this point I realised this had to be a real person. This is what tipped me off. There is no way the game gave him and his wife the same name. The answer, amusingly, is they flipped her name around. She's actually Marie Jean Roland. And I went with her. She seemed more dangerous. What with the assumed name and all. Before Roland's trial, Raymond gives us some mentally advice. He tells us what happened to Bruno. When the Renards came to take Dad's stall, Bruno, in his fury, mutilated one of them. Raymond was to judge the case, and the damage Bruno had done all but assured the death penalty. But Aldrich came begging for his son's life with tears in his eyes. Raymond fought on it, and wound up burning the case files. He settled it out of court. Aldrich was to banish Bruno from the city, turn his stall over to the Renards, and compensate the family of the wounded boy. He says the lesson here is that he showed mercy, and while Bruno would later die anyway, the act of showing mercy was not worthless. Again, whatever verdict you go with in the trial, it doesn't matter. Both Rolands will leave Paris, we're just picking the direction. By now, their reputation is so thoroughly ruined they have to scarper anyway. Though I do love Timville's response if you let one of them off the hook. I enjoy messing with him in general. 
I think Raymond's lesson has a few takeaways. The most surface level is just that being merciful is a virtue in and of itself. It may be a nod to the nature of the choices we're making. It also demonstrates at least some naivety on Ray's part. From a character perspective, Raymond is an odd one. I get that he's an old hand and likely spent much of his life as a judge under far less scrutiny, but it feels like he's somehow unaware of or unaffected by how at the mercy of public opinion we are. Least of all because with the state I was in, showing mercy would have been an instant game over. So, that's the first intrigue, and it was alright, but it's got to be said, we, the revolution, might be one of the most tiring games I've played. It's weird and overambitious, and we're just over halfway through Act 1. The day now goes court, family, strategy, and intrigue. Throw in potential executions, arrested agents, and story segments, and a bit of the intrigue, and you could have maybe five or six speeches per day. And that's not even mentioning cutscenes and random events. Every court case is a short story to learn, understand, and evaluate, before being thrust back into the complex political thriller that is the actual ongoing story. The courtroom, the most complex, interesting, and feature-complete portion of the game can now wind up taking less than half of an in-game day. And it isn't the means by which the plot is advanced, which just seems bizarre to me. I said most of the cases are good, and they are, but I think there's a bit of a slump in actual depth around this point. It may be that the cases got simpler, it may be that I got used to the mechanics and had my workflow, or it may just be that the story mentally overshadows it. Near the start, coming home to the family seemed like a relatively simple choice so you can take a mental breather. Now it's an intermission. The French apparently say the night brings advice. We, oui, the revolution says it brings mini-games. This isn't helped by Robespierre passing the Law of 22, meaning some days we don't even have a case, just some mini-cases. On the one hand, yeah that lets me take a mental breather. On the other hand, that's the best bit of the game excused for the day. It feels like the trials were bait on the hook. I've been tricked into everything else. This does also remove our ability to imprison, leaving us only with the acquit or kill options. While this removes mechanical complexity, it does make the game more difficult, and yeah, that's part of the history. The only time the court is relevant from here on is when we drag the target of our intrigue in here, by which time it's not even really a climax. They're worn down and most of France will have already turned on them. And their cases aren't much more complex than others seeing as we're the one who uncovered or invented it. The constant shifts in gameplay mean I have to mentally swap out rules every few minutes, and this isn't helped by the fact that half of these bits of gameplay feel tacked on. While I love the way the game uses text boxes, they're being spread all over the screen, giving the courtroom an unruly and antagonistic atmosphere with the use of spiked boxes for literal barbed comments. It's fun, but it's quite wearing on the eyes. And this is on top of an already incredibly text-heavy UI. It can also be hard to pass what's important and what isn't as story beats go. Some of the best character moments and biggest reveals are delivered just sat at the dinner table, while important events such as Alexei seeing a dog gets an entire run at Marvel. Taken all together, it's no wonder Alexei looks absolutely shattered at the dinner table. I had to play this game in short bursts and take breaks from it quite often. It's so information dense and mechanically bloated that by this point I had no clue whether I even liked it or not. I just felt I had to keep going. It starts off fine. The mechanics are better at communicating the story than being an engaging rule set by themselves, which I personally am fine with. I was willing to put up with some low blows because I felt the story was delivering on its end of the bargain, being interesting and keeping these mechanics in context. Then more game gets piled on. More and more superfluous game. And eventually, it's just weighing the story down. The part of the product that's actually working. Fortunately, the next arc woke me up a little. It's my favourite. An absolute roller coaster, which is where I came to learn Alexei actually had much of a character to speak of. Ramel comes to us having uncovered that Pash was the one who ordered our hit. Seeing as Pash has an ally in Danton, a head on attack is off the cards. We prefer to go for a heads off approach. I just opened the game to get some footage for a still background shot, but. I need it from a mini case part. I need it from like a speed trial bit, and uh, it's deleted all my saves. That's unfortunate. In reality, Pash was a Gerondin while Danton was a Jacobin. This doesn't mean they couldn't have secretly been in cahoots. In fact, the Gerondins disliked Pash for his political incompetence. So hey, maybe.
What follows is Alexei's terrifying cornering of his attempted killer. First he arranges a meet, during which he feigns ignorance over Pasha's role in the attempt on his life. He demands that as mayor he aid him in finding the culprits, and promises to cut him in on this new gambling den he's operating and gain a friend in the tribunal. Pash can't believe his luck, and doesn't quite question that the gambling den is that brothel we took from Roland, now being operated by Hanryo. Yeah, I handed it over to him, figured it would give him something to do besides my wife. While Alexei and the mayor are becoming fast friends, we also uncover that Pash's daughter Marie is in a relationship with another woman, and Alexei plans to use that against him, much to David's discomfort. I've heard that someone's been trying to kill you. And now you've been promoted to the elite group of murderers, the princes of the guillotine. Congratulations. I never asked to be admitted to the club, but I did not get there accidentally either. Yes. Which is only fair, because Alexei kidnaps Marie's lover Beatrice and forces her into signing a confession that she and Pasha are Austrian spies, threatening to expose their relationship as leverage. Alexei points out that she's doomed either way, but if she signs this confession, he'll give her time to run. This allows us to not only sever Danton's alliance with Posh, but turn him to our side. Danton reveals what the two are plotting. They were obstructing Robespierre's construction of a bridge that was actually finished a couple of years ago in an effort to make Robespierre look ineffectual. Posh has his communications with Danton locked up in a safe. All we need to do is get our hands on them. And Alexei has an idea. The two have Posh arrested. Alexei rushes to the jail demanding to know what's going on. If anyone deserves to be decapitated, it is Danton, for his pretending to be your friend. Forget about loyalty and let me die. I deserve this punishment. And now, believing Alexei is a friend and regretful of what he's done, Pash gives him all the rope he needs to behead him with. The plan almost goes awry when Beatrice escapes our grasp, but instead of fleeing Paris, she instead tries to blackmail Marie. Alexei rushes off with guards in tow to where they're meant to meet. Are you going to kill me now? What does your heart tell you, Monsieur le Juge? Come, Marie. It will be like it never happened, I promise. Perfect fucking intrigue. We're not quite done, but yeah, I was loving this. It was a sucker punch, but it didn't feel out of nowhere. By now, Alexei is bathed in blood, and the depths he went to to get Posh were dark. We had some fun twists and turns here, but now, the only thing left to be twisted is the knife. With minutes before his trial, Posh realizes what Alexei had done. We got him right where we wanted him, took all of his power, and he has no allies to turn to. But then at the trial, Posh does something interesting. He plays it cool, he admits to treason, and just as he's about to try and drag everyone else down with him, we're called away. Frederick. My son. Okay, that's a fucking counterattack. What follows is a great moment. Alexei comes back screaming at Pash, who denies all responsibility. His plan's gone out the window. All of his bravado is gone. The jury's verdict swings hard into execution. Barring an extreme surplus of opinion and mercy beyond mercy, both you and Alexei only have one choice. Thanks, Tinville. Needed the pick-me-up. At home, they're happy I killed the guy, but the dead son's a drag. 
The family is shattered, Bernard is off crying somewhere, Matilde screams at us for gambling with their lives, and Aldrich's trying to hold things together, but she's not having it. But the worst part is, we still have more enemies out there. Jesus Christ game. So, Alexi takes a day off. Just the one. And at the table, Bernard and Matilde confront Alexi over tomorrow's trial of Marie Posh. This moment between Bernard and Alexi is my favourite exchange in the game. I'm almost sad it lacks a cutscene, since it was like getting hit by a splash of cold water. Even after everything Alexi just did in his war against Posh and what his associates in turn did to us, he still thinks it's worth pretending there's a high road, let alone one he can take. It's strange to see him say that killing Marie would be disreputable, since by now, Alexi, mate, We've killed so many people together for no one's benefit but our own. Going back to voice acting and character bios, Alexei is presented at first as unremarkable. The most common sight of him is this slumped, tired posture at the dinner table. I took him as something of a player insert since when he's not talking, he lacks presence. You spend much of the game in his POV looking over the court. He's a character that seems designed to get out of the way. But this chapter sneaks him up on you. That unassuming facade fooled both me and Posh, and it's here I got really invested in his character. When I was playing, by this point I was very much of two minds about this game. I like the court. I dislike basically every other aspect of gameplay. But I was loving this story of a seemingly average man thrust into a cutthroat political underworld, and using his courtroom, an already corrupted symbol of justice, he turns out to be very dangerous. In Wii, the revolution. We don't play as Alexei so much as we play the cold and calculating part of him. The side that understands how the decisions he makes will play out. Alexei may say he has only ever done his job justly. Maybe he even believes it. But we as the player get to see his thought process and know exactly how he weighs up his verdicts. Alexei may genuinely love his family, but he also understands them as tools. The player is taught to treat them that way from moment one. We get to see this with Bernard. Alexei shows he doesn't so much care for Bernard's own dreams and wishes he'd follow him into law. There may be many reasons for this. It could be due to Alexei's implicit worry that Bernard doesn't yet understand the world and his zeal will see him on the wrong side of the courtroom. Because yeah, it's all sunshine and rainbows for you. It could be a misguided belief that the life he has planned for him is better than Bernard being his own man. It could be simple parental arrogance. It could be all that and more. When I got to this intrigue, I was surprised to find out how manipulative Alexei can be, but on reflection, it's not like the game ever really hid that from me. At the end of the day, Alexei is fascinating. He interestingly toyed with my expectations of him being a player insert. He's a character I really like, and a person I really dislike, but at least one I have a shred of sympathy for. He's a believably well-intentioned hypocrite, and the game pulls no punches in showing how destructive that combination can be. Frederic. Funny how it's possible to do that. Sorry, moving on. Act 2 brings one new addition and explores Ramel a bit further. 
This starts with him explaining how our brother died, saving Rommel by dragging him from a losing battle and getting hit in the process. The game tries to be clever with this, tossing us into his story with a new turn-based battle mode. This mode will become a bigger focus in the next act, which is several hours away, so all the tutorializing is jumping the gun a little, since this won't be repeated. This should have given you no details to create a sense of confusion and chaos, then actually explain how it all works when we need to know how to play it. I mean, hey, it sort of works anyway, since this tutorial is sloppy and this is a losing battle anyway. It was cute when I was able to waste the family tutorial, since I'd actually be able to engage with those mechanics within the hour. This should have been regimented better. Rommel had apparently also been banished from Paris by his older brother. He knows the pain of a broken family. Something shady and possibly related does happen. We get a letter asking us how much we know about the man named Rommel, and inviting us to meet. Should we go, we find our informant dead, and Rommel warns us against such meetings. Oh, and there's a revolution in the Vendée, so Robespierre is leaving to settle it personally and, uh, well, I'll see you in three years. This also sticks us with a pretty lasting negative modifier, which I guess makes the game a smidgen more difficult. Besides that, Act 2 is more of the same. The two intrigues that make up its runtime are fine. They can't replicate the punch of Posh, but they give us a chance to explore some of Wii's other ideas and further wear down Alexi. Our next court case begins with a pile of condolences, along with a mysterious note saying one of these people is responsible for Fred's death. Ooh, that's intriguing. Anyway, the next day whoever sent that loses faith and just tells us Gobel did it. And Rommel has info. It turns out Gobel, the Archbishop of Paris, was meant for a military career. That was until he had an illegitimate child and was sent to Rome to join the clergy. I guess he must have been told the church is good at having kids and got the wrong idea. After finishing his education, Gobel came to Paris to find the wife and child. So we'll simply find them first and use them against him. Now, Gobel graduated in 1743. He's been pursuing these two for half a century. I'd argue the odds are slim. The plot begins with spreading rumours about the kid to stir the pot and maybe bring them out into the open. Let's talk about Tinville. He's one of my favourite characters in the game. Unlike Alexi, who seems simple at first, only to slowly reveal themselves, Tinville is two-note yet one-dimensional. In most cases, he's presented as a capable prosecutor. He asks the right questions and keeps people talking. But the moment he comes across someone he believes to be a counter-revolutionary, he becomes a rabid attack dog who wants nothing more than to see their head roll, his rage clouding any sense. In the former form, the game honestly seems to be toning the man down and giving him a really flattering showing. In the latter lawsuits, he's almost cartoonish in his fury, and it's hard to say which one of these would be more accurate. Now there is some precedent. After the Law of 22 passed, silly things like witnesses, trials lasting longer than three days, and uh, a defense counsel, well these were considered extraneous, boring, they bogged the whole legal process down. The jury was asked to acquit or execute based just on a moral judgment of the accused and the prosecutor was leading the show. So Tinville's bluster doesn't seem out of place. The guy was nicknamed purveyor to the guillotine after all. This comes to a head in what is perhaps the game's funniest trial. A craftsman whose family specializes in chessboards has been dragged in by the guards and accused of spreading royalist propaganda. It's a ridiculous concept that's mined for a lot of really good gags. Tinville steals the show. He is very much the butt of the joke. The one man who can't see what a complete sham this whole case is. Even the generally antagonistic gallery sees this whole thing as bogus. They think Tinville's off his nut. Gobel's intrigue brings Tinville into the picture. I was very much enjoying having Tinville in the court. I was enjoying that for all of his zeal and how dedicated to the law he appears, he seemed blissfully unaware of just how corrupt the judge of his courtroom is. He is made a patsy while the judge disposes of his own political rivals. We both know that you are the author of the denunciation. How can you be so sure? I am not a fool. You have eliminated Roland and Pash, and now you are trying to get Gobel. Uh, never mind. Tinville knew. He just didn't care. This doesn't get in the way of our plans to get Tinville to investigate Gobel using those rumors we stirred. What's funny is this persuasion even has a unique failure state. Tinville will play a game of dice to see if luck favors Alexei, the man whose son was murdered several days ago. 
So yeah, it's a bit weird, and I never would have guessed that was in his character that he believes in luck, but sure, that brings a new angle to what he's doing at the court. Turns out luck isn't on Alexei's side, who would have guessed? As we're closing in on Gobel, the rumours of his child do bring the sprog into the picture. He tries to go right to Gobel, and Gobel makes a play. He rejects the child, declares himself an apostate, and reveals that in five days he's going to publish a list of 73 traitors, hinting Robespierre is among them. And considering days earlier we made a public display against Gobel, it's not much of a stretch to say that we made the list. Oh, now you come to me. Well, Alexis tells the guy to run before his dad has us all killed. I guess Alexei is just gonna stay here and try to figure something out. The situation seems impossible, but impossible isn't French. That saying really doesn't work in English. And as the game puts it, a perfect intrigue. Yeah, perfect isn't how I would describe that conclusion, but uh, yeah, let's keep going. This intrigue drags Alexei down a bit. He goes up against a far more cautious and powerful opponent, and his own plotting just doesn't pan out. Meanwhile, Rommel is clearly keeping something from us. It's also joined by the reveal that even an idiot like Tinville saw right through us. Alexei is not quite as discreet as he'd like to think. It builds a good bit of tension and does manage to make another chip in Alexei's armor. After taking his son, the game starts wounding him personally. Luckily, the son goes and kills Gobel, and as thanks for saving us, I had to execute him. It's funny how the theme of strained fatherhood is slipped into this story. It's ever-present, but I never felt it as strongly as I did other aspects like freedom and justice. Unlike those, it wasn't even until I started writing that I realized how consistently dastardly demanding dads had been a thing. It's probably because parenthood, while present, isn't a powerful part of play. That and because I have no children. At least none that I know of. The game opens with us judging our son. I was unaware then that I was handing down a death penalty, but Aldrich feels his generation had more or less condemned those that follow to pain through their mistakes. Hardly a surprising view considering what he's been through. Perhaps we're just the second in a row. Alexei keeps his family around despite the peril. Gobel wanted to find and be rid of his son. Raymond's mentoring is well-intentioned but ill-suited. Many of the trials explore parental bonds. Even King Lewis is like a disappointed dad, calling on Uncle HRE to beat his child into submission. I shouldn't have said that. And while all of this is going on, we're also invited to a ball, being held by none other than Renard. Alexei isn't planning on going, but he's promised the identity of his son's killer. At the manor, Alexei is funneled through a sea of masked aristocrats. Renard is playing an intimidation game. A game where he has plentiful experience. Thank you for accepting our invitation. That's why everyone hates aristocrats. I didn't really feel like having a choice. English not your first language, eh? Fair point. Thank you anyway. Renard talks about how the rich are now being persecuted as the poor once were and that soon the tide will turn back in their favour. Our moves have only served to unite the aristocracy. But we're not here for that. We're here to meet this masked gentleman. I personally think that our disguised partner overestimates you. He has also reassured us that he doesn't intend to kill any other member of your family. He killed my child? You did that? See how powerful we, the Highborn, have become- Shush, Renard. This isn't about you. He offers a game of dice. If we win, we'll be delivered yet another man who helps kill our child. Fine. Let's play. We've avenged this kid about twice already, but sure, let's go for the hat trick. I play along and win. The next day, the accused is none other than Raymond. He was dragged to court after an anonymous letter sent the guards to his home, where he was found sobbing and far from sober, drunkenly begging to know if Frederick was alive. His part in our son's death was minor. Turns out Ray hasn't seen his own son in a long time. His drinking created a rift in the family, leading his wife to an early grave and driving his son to join the military. He's now a deserter awaiting death. In return for details about our life, he was promised that his son would be saved. He's obviously filled with regret that he went along with it, saying he never thought it would lead to this. I wound up acquitting Ray, going against the jury and making some difficulty for myself besides. If you reject to play dice or lose, the game continues on. And in my run, Raymond later took his own life. 
the guilt having gotten to him and the promises about his son being little more than lies. It's time to talk about choices. If you read the Steam reviews, they sit at mostly positive, which does about line up with my personal experience. Most every review that likes the game likes it in spite of one feature or another. The second most common criticism behind the shallow sampling platter approach to gameplay is that choices don't matter. No matter what you do, you are prisoner to a linear story. Burrell loses his job, Frederick his life. Your enemies flee and Matilde despises you. As I was playing and as I came to realise how little agency I had, it didn't take long to put together that that was the point. As Ramel tells Alexi, they are men who don't allow others to control their lives. Ironic to say to a video game protagonist, doubly so to one who has done everything because someone else set him to do it. Triply ironic considering Napoleon is coming. The game pretends to have choice in every aspect, since both you and Alexi are meant to believe in your own free will. The hierarchy screen paints a world of cause and effect that implies agency, but your path through it is preordained. The targets of your intrigue, even when you spare them, will have to flee Paris and be crossed off the screen. When Raymond preached mercy being its own reward even if death soon followed, I said it was a hint to the true nature of our choices, and this is why. Raymond, for the record, who may well have been forced into his role in our son's death. Aldrich speculates that when Raymond brokered the deal for Bruno's life, he didn't get Renard's approval without cost to himself. To think this game not altering the course of events based on your choices is a flaw is like thinking Doom is a lesser game because the ending doesn't account for not killing demons. The framing of the games is different, but either way it's missing the point. Your choices in We, the revolution matter because they don't. To entertain another thought, even if this isn't explicitly a question the game is asking, what if we, the revolution, did change endings based on how many people you spared? Would your choice to spare people despite difficulty to yourself become more or less moral? Some people would say it doesn't matter, but that's not what we're arguing about. If you're aware the game isn't accounting for it and you spare them anyway, you're doing it without expectation of reward. It's inherently more selfless. If you're expecting it to pay off for you, you're sparing them for your own benefit. The decision is tainted. Now, as humans rigged with survival instincts, I'm not saying it's wrong to factor your own gain into choices like this. It's perfectly understandable, but in video games we're detached from any actual danger, and weird little moral questions like this can be explored. It seems with games we're rigged to expect them to pat us on the back for doing the right thing, and people seem to lash out when that isn't followed up on regardless of context or what the point of the story is. In past videos I've been harsh on false choices, but we? The revolution integrates them well by weaving them into the narrative. It's only a trick for so long. The game isn't exactly subtle about it, and I can say with confidence it wants you to realise this is happening. I think it's a cool idea that works well as a theme layered into a political thriller. To think you're in control and slowly realise there are forces, both literal and thematic, going against that. It's a trick that can only work so well with interactivity. Some people also just can't stand playing as an unlikable protagonist, and look, some people don't like spicy food. It's okay. Some of us are condemned to bland taste. To keep the fourth intrigue brief, we're going up against Robespierre, so we need powerful backing. To that end, we forge an alliance between Danton and Hebert. Hebert. I'm gonna call him Herbert. It's wrong, I don't care. Their meeting is tense, but that's Alexi's fault for picking a place with such intense lighting. In an attempt on Rob's blood pressure, Danton gives up his place in the committee while Alexi convinces Tinville to take it. Tinville is clean and ambitious, so Rob will see this as a threat. Hanriot, however, betrays us and takes Rob's side. Danton and Herbert are arrested, and we can only trial one. I have no idea why we're allowed to try either, it seems like Rob would want to keep us as far away from them as possible, but uh, let's have a look. Uh, Danton it is. I get him acquitted, and both him and Herbert flee Paris. Thanks guys, you're really sticking your necks out for me. So we try and arrest Hanriot, fail, and he later dies in the story anyway. But then Alexi decides, fuck it, let's just promise everyone who helps us cushy careers and convince the entire convention Robespierre's gotta go. Yeah, I just truncated us taking down the most important historical figure present. But this intrigue is pretty clumsy and not in an interesting way like Gobel's snatched victory. Let's talk about Robespierre's final months. 
The Law of 22 tanks opinion of him. He kills Danton and Herbert along with many of their followers. He then becomes massively paranoid. He appears on a fake mountain wearing a toga. He shot himself in the mouth, which broke his streak of shooting himself in the foot. And his brother, wanting in on the action, dived out of a window and fell just a hair slower than the guillotine which killed all of them. Things get a bit more orderly for a moment, but there is a reaction. Now, if you're expecting an idiot gaming YouTuber to come away with a definitive take on an incredibly complicated and nuanced period of history that historians have stewed over for their lives, I'm sorry to say that, like Napoleon, I'll come up short. But I can say with confidence, the game misses a trick by showing Robespierre as just an evil despot. Robespierre, the revolution, and we, the revolution, began by promising freedom that turned out bloody and hollow. The game could have tapped into this and made the theme more apparent in its portrayal of Robespierre. As I learn more about him, I understand that he had to go. If his proposed virtues and the law of 22 weren't all part of a hidden agenda from the get-go, then the man became and died a hypocrite, who swore liberty before shackling the very people he made that oath to. Besides a big blade, it's hard to say what was going through his head come the end. If he doesn't deserve sympathy, he should at the least get some complexity for the sake of the story told. It's already attempted nuanced interpretations of even more one-dimensional historical figures. He could have stood as the perfect antagonist to tie these ideas of choice into a neat little bow. The good news is, the game will try to wrap up this theme. The bad news is, it will do it in the most mind-numbing way possible with an even worse villain. Your eyes were never so empty. But... Today, I want you to be proud of me. By now, Matilda's just done. Her husband snaked his way to the top, so much blood is on his hands, one of their kids is dead, yet he still wants her to be proud of him. Unfortunately for both of them, the universe isn't quite done with Alexei Fidel, as goons bust in and take the family hostage. And you know what? Alexei really had it coming. The guy just never stopped going to work. He got stabbed, his son died, he made enemies of everyone in Paris. But 9 to 5, you knew where to find him. Say what you want about the guy's morality, but his work ethic was second to none. Oh god, a Skyrim? Yeah, fucking... <laughs> she had sex with a 14 year old boy. Uh... I'm gonna quit because I think this would please the aristocracy. No, that just pissed off everybody. Alexei is brought before none other than, bum bum bum, his banished brother Bruno. You were in the dark for so long. Remember that guy in the intro, brained someone with a rock, had father issues? Well, that was Bruno. And that poor geezer on the floor is what he's about to do to the story. It turns out Bruno didn't die on the front lines. He was captured, and when they forced him to play a game of dice for his limbs, well, bit of a sore loser, he fled after one bad round. From there, he headed back to Paris, deciding to take up arm against everyone he's decided has wronged him. I was able to escape and started planning my revenge on our family, our father. On everyone who had disowned me. Revenge? On us? You should lay the blame on Clément Rinard. He was the one to- I blame you all. Father, you, France. You want to hurt your own family? You disowned me, as God disowned Cain. Ramel and him were in cahoots. Ramel was sent to us to stir our desire for power and guide us along the path Bruno wanted while he somehow got in good with the aristocrats and pulled their strings. We dealt with the Rolands, Pache, Gobel, and Robespierre. This was all Bruno's plot from the very beginning, and he played us like a damn fidel. He needed the revolution to happen this way so he could build an army from the people hurt by it. All along, we've been feeding the people wronged and abandoned by France into his ranks. He really kept his army up his sleevey. His corruption of us... This was his revenge on Aldrich. In his eyes, the death of another son wouldn't hurt as much as watching the survivor become yet another villain. And he's sure that Aldrich would then abandon Alexei as he did him. Well, spoiler for that, when this is explained to Aldrich, he says Bruno died years ago. That man isn't his son. And Aldrich is basically the only person to never give up on Alexei. His faith in his remaining son is absolute and honestly rather sweet. 
Then we're made to play for Bernard's arms. Three rounds of dice for his digits. And you will always lose at least once, since this chapter is dedicated to screaming in your face that choice isn't real. Ramel then busts in and saves us because I've told this story a bit out of order. But honestly, after this scene, I was checked out harder than Matilde. Bruno's returning with his army in several days. He's gonna storm Paris and take it over. We're screwed. To the game's credit, I didn't see this twist coming. Even with what I now realise was a mountain of foreshadowing. I'd like to say I didn't see it coming because I respected the game too much to expect something this stupid. I always took those moments with Bruno as good fuel for Alexei's character, and they still are. But the fact that this is what it's leading up to just leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It wants to let Bruno eat cake and have it too. The game treats him as an unstable lunatic who misread how Aldrich will respond. He's bloodthirsty and short-sighted and he was shunned all across France, saved purely by some measure of tainted luck. Yet he's also a cunning fox who twisted all of France around his finger, misleading the very aristocracy that banned him while building an army of disaffected commoners through us. It wants to have it both ways with Bruno. Individually, these are terrible resolutions to the story we just had. Put together, if I wasn't so disappointed, I'd find it laughable. I get what the game is trying to do with Bruno. As Alexei would say, he has a raison d'etre. False choices destroying his life. Sins of the father coming full circle. Fraternity. It turns out the real revolution is his revolution. With Frederick, he funneled us down a path of incredibly imprecise and wide-reaching revenge, putting Alexei and the player on the same path as Bruno before meeting us at the pass. I'll also admit, his reveal does actually smooth over some lingering questions I'd had. Perhaps Roland believes I trampled on his name at trial because Bruno told him I did. No more family members died because Bruno was exact in how he wanted to hurt us. And well, the fact there was only one attempt on our life was strange since yeah, as I said, Alexei doesn't miss work. He'd make any assassin's day with how much of a routine he lives by. So yeah, his inclusion isn't without merit, and he's a turkey stuffed with meaning. But stuff him, he ruined my trip to the convention. This is why Robespierre becomes so disappointing in retrospect. He's also a charismatic and driven man rendered unstable. But considering the history, it's something that actually happened. Did the game just push Robespierre under the guillotine to just do him again with their own super cool mysterious brother character? The theme of illusory choice just becomes ham-fisted with the way Bruno brings it to bear. The reason I was able to say with confidence that lack of choice was the point was because the game, with confidence, lost all confidence. In a single scene, we, the revolution, manages to overplay its hand, drop the ball, and boot it over a shark. My faith in the right in going backwards from here is tested. Also, Act 3 hasn't technically started yet, but fuck it. I've reasserted some control and moved this arbitrary title card forward. Everything we've done is then leaked to Marat, which he publishes and dies in a bathtub, which would later be carried through the streets of Paris as part of his funeral. Meanwhile, David is so disgusted with what we've done that he buggers off and hopes history forgets about all of this. Too bad, David. I'm gonna make sure they remember. And I'm sorry to say that after that one scene kills so much goodwill, the game's not gonna win it back. A few days later, we join Alexei as he's busily sat around waiting for Bruno to come kill him. Terror is nothing but swift justice. And now an army of outcasts marches towards us to present their interpretation of those words. Do you come to arrest me? Alexei sounds so excited just to get this over with. I came to tell you that certain people believe everything you did, you did for the benefit of France. Who are you? Officer Thomas Alexandre Dumas from the French army at your service. So, tomorrow Bruno's army arrives, and the military's a dozen days away. Dumas wants to enlist our help in defending Paris. I think you're talking to the wrong person. Just let me die on this table, okay? I am talking to a predator. I am talking to a person who is not averse to killing other citizens. And that is what awaits us. We will have to ruthlessly murder Frenchmen who stand on the other side of the barricades. I love this scene for just how far beyond it all Alexei looks. This is one of the best expressions ever drawn. It rivals fucking Tails gets trolled for just how much it's saying. Alexei almost wants to argue, but man, what's the point? 
If you won't let me pass away at this table, I've got more at home. You think I'm scared of disappointing my family? Anyway, enough delaying. He's got an army and he'll entrust them to us if we make him the first black general of France. Those people believe that if they are scared of you, our enemy should be even more terrified. Hand me a piece of paper and a pen, General. The map screen changes from a social strategy to a city defense, in what I'll admit is a cool little recontextualization. We're given a random set of units, the amount dictated by reputation, and we're told to spread them around. Doing this feels clumsy, since the spaces you have to place the units in is somewhat precise, while RUI goes for an imprecise, semi skeuomorphic design. Meanwhile, the bar for setting the amount of units is actually wider than it appears. It gets even more annoying if you want to shuffle units around, since if you want to put them back in the toolbar, you have to drag them back into their proper place along it. It's a headache to do even the most basic things, and it never feels good to use, and you have to engage with this a lot over the next several hours. These little headaches add up because it always means you're thinking about avoiding the UI's shortcomings rather than just playing the game. Bruno's assault path is predetermined, and if he takes part of the city, it can't be reclaimed. So at the start, we only have to deal with one very hard battle per day. If he takes that section, then he'll attack every neighboring district. And while these battles will be a bit easier, I just don't want him taking sections, since, easy or not, that means every day is three times as long. Each day and during each battle, citizens will flee. Our secondary goal is to give time for people to evacuate. The achievement for doing well in this section is for saving half of them, which should tell you how well you're expected to do. So here's how the battle system works. You take your assortment of barely explained units, you can tag out a unit slot for a healer, which, well, you want the healer since they buff a rose defense immensely, you have a set of tactics, and you can sort of see how each of them will play out. Once picked, each side makes their move. This plays out painfully slowly. So let's turn on my audio track. This chapter takes ages. Every day is at least one battle. And as it goes on, this will only get worse. These sluggish slugfests take roughly three minutes each, and that's after I knew the optimal strategy. I know by now that mashing the mouse doesn't do anything, but I have to do anything to pass the time. This is just the perfect follow-on after the story had wrecked my investment in it, to play an awkward, shallow, but strangely obtuse and intentionally frustrating battle system. Three minutes may not sound like much, but trust me, with repetition like this and my investment dead, three minutes can feel like a very long time when you're just stewing in disappointment. The battles are ones of attrition. Since damage is unavoidable, you have to lose units. Each new day sees some more random unfortunate souls filter in. I wish I could spend my influence points to get the troops I wanted, but well, that's not what the game is going for. This segment wants you to feel like you're barely holding on and keep the pressure at a high. When you see you don't get fresh artillery, it's meant to sting. It's just that the pace is too glacial to be tense and the gameplay is too tedious to have the needed punch. As you lose areas and civilians die, your reputation drops, meaning you now have to hold more places with less troops. The battles are functionally easier, but it's balanced for your hull to gradually erode. It's just a... God, just erode faster. The already slow days get slower. And I'll confess that in a misguided effort to speed this up, I probably made it longer for myself. I kept resetting until I found an optimal strategy. I hated the battles enough that I was driven especially hard to understand them. And I eventually found it. In a guide when I gave up. Now, I regret doing this. It was stupid, petty, wasteful. And while I do not like this mechanic and do not think it got what it set out for, I ruined it further for myself. But since I did it, here's the strat. You have to work from the back row forwards. Entrenchment defends the front row and will wreck enemy artillery. Then suppressing fire eliminates enemy gunners while the forward row continues to hold. Then frontline assault to kill the remaining infantry. All while a medic caters to your cannons. This approach was by far the most safe, though I was still losing units, and if the enemy uses entrenchment on their first turn, it all falls apart. If I lose my cannons and don't get new ones, it all falls apart. This game, well, it already fell apart, but it's not done. 
eventually your grip loosens. And at that point, you're not going to regain your hold. But still, I managed to keep them to one section. Oh. Yeah, I was never lucky enough to have enough cannons for two districts. So, what is Dumas doing exactly? Well, he's the auto battle option, but he basically always loses. The effectiveness rating and the units you place don't actually seem to mean anything, and he will always fail to hold the first section. Turns out, Dumas is a dumbass. Thank god your son took up writing instead. This mode is just terrible. Such an awful addition to close the gameplay on. It's all of the game's worst aspects of ambiguity and guesswork design with none of the intrigue or thoughtfulness of the court. None of the intrigue and, uh, intrigue of intrigues. Like speeches, it's meant to be a bit confusing at first so you have to learn and adapt, only the situation is so much more perilous. People's lives are at stake so you're pressured to learn fast. This is meant to be a culmination of all the other gameplay styles. Lives on the line, confusion, unfairness, death. But it's so dull to play. If it was sped up and didn't come after such a schlocky story swerve, perhaps I'd be a little bit more positive to it. But that's a long shot. Clever segue go. Oh wait, I said the word intrigue in the last paragraph. There's another of those, and it's as half-baked as this battling. With the city under siege, Germaine de Stael decides to use this moment to campaign for women's rights. And as the game puts it, if we don't stop this today, we may not wake up tomorrow. She goes to Alexei, who I guess is just in charge of Paris now, and lays down what's gonna happen. She's read the reports, she knows how good a schemer we are, so tomorrow we have to go and convince the men to support women's rights. If we don't meet all of their demands, they'll simply stop helping the war effort. Pretty compelling. I'll beat some sense into my wife later! Yeah, this'll be rough. Who supported you when you were bearing the standards of the revolution? They carried them at your sides with you! But we can't treat them any better! They're not a fan. What's hilarious is the best result in this situation is doubtful, even with only perfect arguments. Well now you've confused us! What on earth made you negotiate with hags? They just can't comprehend it. Now, Alexei isn't actually on De Stael's side, so right after talking to the menfolk, he has Grace Elliot arrested and gets her to work fabricating evidence against De Stael. The next day, we can either arrest and try De Stael, or just sign off on the Declaration of Women's Rights. Which I do. The next day I get a letter of thanks from all women. Cheers. That's how it ends, by the way. Bit abrupt. A strange half-length back and forth that has no time for its subject matter. Let's flash back a second. Act 1 was called Liberté. Besides the obvious context of the French Revolution, in game terms this is the part where new choices are being revealed to you at every turn. Alexei and the player are ignorant to what all of this means. Egalité is... Well, I could argue it's where Alexei levels the playing field with his enemies. Truth be told, Egalité better suits Act 1 as well, considering we kill the king and revolution's in full swing. But hey, they've gone with a theme and it's my job to mine some meaning out of it. So, Act 3 is fraternity, and it isn't just being literal with Bruno. It's one thing to preach equality, start arguing what equality even means, and all the while deny it to half the population. Especially when women were fighting right alongside the men. Weird as it sounds, I'm worried I got no pushback for this. No negative modifiers, no loss of influence or opinion. I made a choice that should have seen people turn on me. We saw those blokes. The thing is, we're so close to the end by now, it can't meaningfully account for this decision, even if it wanted to. We? The revolution skims this even more than it skims most other aspects of the revolution. The whole finale feels emptier than Alexei's life. It could be that without Ramel guiding Alexei, he now just goes right for the throat, trimming as much fat from his plan as possible to focus on Bruno. It could be to show how weak a position women have that Alexei could just easily get some dirt on Stale fabricated. But it doesn't change that it's just abrupt, and besides how funny the ending is, it just isn't that interesting and- wait, hang on a second. We could try Stale. Yeah, Alexei is still going to work in the morning. Despite everything that's happened, he has taken a grand total of two days off. That's just one number higher than his remaining son's arms.
By now, I don't even feel the trials. I'm like Alexi. We're still united because we're both dead inside. I know I've got to do battles in the evening and I can't even find joy in sending people to the guillotine anymore. I'm just murdered out. Anyway, despite giving Matilde rights, she left. Bernard left too because he only has a right. I do actually think the relationship between Alexi and Aldrich is one of the game's strengths. There's a bit of sweetness to Aldrich's endless faith in his son, even if they've in some ways steered each other wrong. After the next day, we're confronted by a broken Matilde. Matilde. No, oh, not again. I do not understand. Yeah. Father. Do you hear me? Always. Alexi awaits on the table of the puppeteer. Uh, who are you? I am the truth about your unhappiness and the lie about your greatness. If Bruno didn't spell the message out, the puppeteer is a blasting neon sign that our choices were illusory. Our path predetermined not just by people pulling our strings figuratively, but by a literal universal force. Are you ready to admit that it is my performance, my show? And now he's offering the only real choice we'll ever have. To live and be a hero or die on this table. Oh man, if only you got to me a few days ago. Despite the fact we've held the line for eight days now and reinforcements are less than a work week away, a normal person's not sodding Alexi's, he complains Bruno's unbeatable. Shut the fuck up, Alexi. Tell me, when was the last time you read all the files connect- You as well! Shut it! You're all annoying me. I hate that it tosses in this paranormal shit at the last second. I've enjoyed most of the story, but I've never taken it as incredibly clever or thought that there was some real deep shit to say. Just that it's been an entertaining thriller with some good undertones to dig into, a bit of food for thought. And it trying to make it all some deterministic wank like this at the last second is just tossing out everything good the plot had, and for what? The reason I liked it when I was picking up on it during Gobel and Robert Pierre's arcs wasn't just because Ooh, it's subtle, me smart critic. Cause it wasn't subtle then, despite Steam reviews who, well, turns out those people need all the help they can get. It's literally spelled out for them and they just complain that multiple endings don't exist instead of tackling why this doesn't work. So lies it, you are here for power. For the numerous choices and endings, I have not designed you for that. And subtlety isn't some nectar from heaven, it's about how you want to present the ideas you got. So I'm not saying this is shit because it lacks subtlety, it's because it just detracts from everything good that came before it. Having it as a backing theme of a political thriller let me stew on it, think about it, it was a dash of spice in the story. That we think we have choices while actually we were having our strings pulled. Figuratively. Again. Having it play second fiddle to a second fidel was weak and felt like failing confidence, but it was leagues better than having it be all about choices and having everything be preordained besides the option to die in such a stupid swerve. What does this add to our historical drama beyond maybe excusing its anachronistic indulgences? Anachronisms I didn't care about. I already accepted them for the sake of the story. The idea was arguably more impactful when it was just subtext because it had wormed its way into me. It's when the game tries to force it on me that I start to resist it. This game ends with enough bum notes to play scales. More bum notes than a fucking ass orchestra. So I choose not to die. Mostly out of spite. But don't worry, I'll show the other ending. Will they accept me? They do not have to, but you will defend them anyway. So the next day marks the final court case. Turns out knifing your hubby's a crime, so welcome back to family court. Truth be told, this is actually a great case to end on. The pretense of this being anything other than a really dark and bitter argument instead of a trial is instantly dropped. Alexi and Matilde just spend the whole time trading barbs and Tinville is powerless to stop it. It's also confirmed, you can't spell Henry O without NTR. I sort of hate she was cackling after stabbing us because this cold airing of the grievances is so much stronger than her just being crazy. I guess that knife let the air out. And now the healing can begin.
This trial, better than Bruno and the bloody puppeteer do for choice, puts a really neat bow on the family gameplay. The fact that it's a tiny insignificant speck on our radar is brought full circle as yeah, no shit she and the family felt powerless and neglected. We spent more time pursuing our power plays even before we were thrown into big danger. Only Aldrich didn't feel that way and that's because he fed that desire Alexi had. Anyway, good point wife, acquitted. Get the fuck out of here. The jury in Tinville flee shortly after, and on the twelfth day... Reinforcements delayed? I just want this over. I don't appreciate this little prank. So, I just throw my hands up. If Bruno wants Paris that much, he can have it. And, it turns out, the game is programmed to just keep going until you have just your home district left. At the time, I thought I had limped over the finish line, but it turns out, you have no choice but to lose it all. In walks Bruno, saying his Siege of Paris was all a ploy to introduce us to our new conqueror. His name is Napoleon Bonaparte. And by doing this, he's won. I never wanted to take over the city. I've just introduced you to your new dictator. I won. Sure, mate. Sure, this was all your big brain play. With basically nothing left to do, Bruno brandishes a pistol, and they'll settle this with a test of luck. The favored shall kill the loser. Shooting him in the head. Let's talk about dice. There's nothing left to talk about. They only come up a handful of times, but I think it's the game trying to get around choice, trying to softball it, so that when the puppeteer claims you've never made real choices, it can pretend that was the case. What about with Renard? Well, we didn't actually agree to get the identity of our killer. We agreed to a game of dice. Doesn't count. To what degree wasn't that a choice? Is it because it's now a matter of destiny, not decision? I don't know. I'm tired. This game's messaging is just so sloppy that by now it's just throwing pseudo-thoughtful garbage my way. With this ending, we don't choose whether or not we shoot Bruno. We leave it in the hands of fate. And so it seems like the puppeteer gave us our only true moment of freedom. God, this is lame. You have all believed in this romantic rebellion. Tell me. No. Outside, Alexei feels strangely sad that people are welcoming Napoleon as a hero. His part in protecting Paris seemingly already forgotten. Hero. The puppeteer and his kid arrive to cheer Alexei up. And make my eyes roll harder than the dice we just closed with. Man, if only David was here to see this. Who shall be next? <sighs> Post credits, in the modern day, Alexei is remembered as the hero of Paris. Since as you know, figures from the French Revolution are often remembered so cleanly. And here's the alternate ending if he dies on the table. Honestly, probably for the best. This game comes off as so uncertain about what it even wants to say about linearity and false choice, but comes off as confident about whatever it is. The claim that to live or die is our only real choice feels undermined by the fact it has less impact than many supposedly false choices we've made along the way. A lot of people took my Walking Dead video as wholly negative, a blunt criticism that we are lied to by having choices that only change small aspects instead of changing the course of entire stories when that was not my intent. A failure of clarity on my end, perhaps. But for season one of that game, and for we, the revolution, I'll say that I don't consider the ability to change parts of the tone, characters, and ornamentation, but not the path of a story, to be a bad thing. It's about the framing and the story itself. The tools should aid the construction, and the construction should be good. Yet we is leading you along, believing its own choices are completely devoid of value, waiting to jump out and yell, See? We knew all along! Tragically misunderstanding that it wasn't actually doing anything wrong until the moment it takes that leap. If it had kept Choice's subtext, let Alexei run roughshod over revolutionary Paris before the Fermidorian reaction or Napoleon or the Restoration crushed him under history's uncaring boot, this theme would have said more by not having to say anything concrete at all. And not even just about choices, but about history, legacy, liberty, and even fraternity. 
Alexei is a cruel man who caused great misery, but the game seems sympathetic because it presents him as a man prisoner to the cruelties of the where and when. His victories are close, fraught with danger and short-lived. He played the game and couldn't quite cut it. To lay it out in the open and attribute it to the power of fiction itself not only drastically culls the scope of the message and takes a lot of meaning away from it, it also puts the idea up for a scrutiny that suggests consistency. A consistency which, when actually found, only serves to undermine the point it supposedly wants to make. It lane switches into a dead end. Looking at this in mechanical, not thematic terms, the choice to imprison Louis instead of executing him creates greater change even within the narrative itself. Alexei's death changes a line of dialogue and a headstone. This trial decides between a graphic and a fully voiced cutscene. The game wants you to realise you're a puppet on strings, but doesn't realise its own wires got crossed. Hang on, is that why Alexei sounds wooden? Because he's a puppet. Oh, fuck off. Ending on dice feels ultimately desperate because what it wants to say is that Alexei has realised that fate owns him. He's accepted his place in a cruel and deterministic world and come to understand its harsh rules. Everyone who entered his courtroom rolled these dice. If the judge needed you to live that day, you would. If not, tough luck. But hey, nothing personal. We're all at the mercy of others here. So Alexei agrees to play. And if he loses, the outcome of this game won't contradict him. He chose to live. It was fate that decided he had to die. It wants to say that. And I suppose, in a way it does. But the words ring hollow. So, yeah. So, not to judge it too harshly. Ugh. But we? The Revolution may be one of the most bloated titles I've ever played. An indecisive stumbling mess of a game. One that can spell out exactly what it's doing and still have people judge it for exactly that. While seemingly never seeing the intentionality. Or perhaps just not caring. What an accidentally perfect game to play after Yeek. The illusion of choice has become a recurrent topic in games I cover. And to be honest, I don't think there's a silver bullet. It's arrogant and naive to demand that all choices be catered to. It just can't happen without tons of time, budget, and planning. Scope is a monstrous thing. We, the revolution, for a time had me appreciating the way it tackled false choices, by turning belief in my agency into my and Alexei's downfall. I, in a way, saw it coming, but I wanted to play along because the game had charmed me. To play along meant I'd get more out of the game, I'd enjoy my time rather than regret it. The way it then ran everything I was enjoying about it into the ground. Was my trust abused? Maybe, but I doubt this was an act of malice. We should be open to let stories toy with us, even if it stings worse when they drop the ball. The character of Alexei was almost going to be an all-time favourite. I was seeing him as a Walter White-like figure in how he pretended not to be who he truly was, hiding his true colours as best he could, even from himself. But the way the story goes, and to a lesser extent, a wooden performance, just goes against him. As for the gameplay, well, it's an overloaded mess. In pursuing mechanics that try to supplement and tie into the story being told, it winds up distracting since you spend every in-game day swapping between totally different games that have varying amounts of importance to the ongoing narrative. From semi-logical guesswork to memorization to probability to strategy, it's too many flavors and winds up undercutting the very thing it's going for. It's the helicopter parent of gaming, trying to do everything for its little story, but winding up obstructive and overbearing. Much like... For fuck's sake. For those who took my word, satisfied their curiosity, and played it, I hope I don't actually have to be sorry I sent you down that road. The ending is an unbelievable botch job, but even then its gameplay and theme seem to rub plenty of people the wrong way to begin with. I hope you can appreciate that I do believe it's a game worth experiencing for good and for a lot of ill. You may feel your time was wasted by many of its elements, but if you can claw any intrigue from the time spent, it wasn't wasted. And I hope this video entertained and informed. I ended Greedfall by hoping 2020 would be good, and for a lot of people it's been rough. I hope to have more consistent releases in 2021, but more than that, I just hope the next year is less... historical than this one. A bit easier for all. It turns out living in historical times can be a little boring, but I hope next year I'll be right alongside to hopefully make your days just that bit more laid back. If next year's even worse, I'll stop ending the last video of each year with well wishing, because despite everything the game just taught me, I may have more power than I know. 
So that was we, the revolution. And next up is Yakuza 5, which just got announced for PC, which makes things more confusing for me. If you want to support me, please spread this video around. If you want to support me more directly, I have a Patreon filled with the lovely people scrolling past. It has benefits such as access to a Patreon Discord, which is very laid back, access to scripts and notes at $3, and bonus afterthought videos at $5, where I answer viewer questions about the game in question, and that was awkward, and tie up any extra thoughts. So, I'll see you all soon. Court is adjourned. Merry Christmas. This is a good Christmas game, right? <laughs>